for deciduous landscape plants. Um, this is our first part of our lecture on plant classification. Um, we'll look at sort of formal and informal and scientific ways of classifying plants. One way to classify plants is based on the life expectancy of the plants. Plants have wide and varied um, life expectancy, their length of life. Um, the annuals just live one season. They start from seed, they have their vegetative growth, their reproductive growth, and then they die in just one growing season. The biennials are very similar to the annuals, but it, only, but it takes two years. So usually they do foliage first year, flower and seed the second year, and then their life is over. A perennial will keep on growing many, many years. There's there's a wide range, you know, as far as the absolute length of life, but they live to a mature growth and then, um, then their life is over. Two main groups of perennials, you've got the herbaceous, which is always new um, current season foliage. So the foliage comes out in the spring, um, it grows during the growing season, there's flowering, there's seeding, um, and then in the winter time, it, it, they freeze back to the roots. The roots remain alive, but the foliage returns every spring. The plant will actually increase in growth as the roots grow, but they never have a stem that um, stays on, you know, throughout the winter. And woody plants we don't normally think of as being perennial, but they are. They stay alive from year to year. They stay alive constantly, just like the herbaceous perennials, but their stems remain alive instead of dying back to the ground. So the woody plants um, increase in uh, size every year until they reach a mature size. There's a huge broad category of these plants um, from small shrubs to large trees, evergreen, deciduous, from desert plants to mountain plants. So it's a, it's a large variety, but they, they uh, retain their growth. They can build on their woody growth each year and add to that. Another way to classify plants is not so much by their length of life or whether or not they remain alive from year to year, but the size and the growth habit, which the habit is mainly just the form. Um, these very commonly used words, but they, they have some characteristics that go along with them. Trees are usually a single stem, although there are some multi-stem trees, mainly in an upright form and over 15 feet tall. Now that's a, that's a guideline, you know, it's, it's just a general classification. Shrubs can be anywhere from a foot tall to 20 feet tall, usually very, very densely stemmy, um, not so much just a single stem or it would be a tree. Um, vines are also very variable. They, they may um, attach by twining, which means wrapping around an object to, to climb, or there may be attaching where they actually have um, sort of an adhesive in their roots or their stems and can attach to either a tree or a wall or some kind of structure. Um, and ground covers typically just crawl along the ground. They don't necessarily climb anything. Um, some ground covers are just prostrate shrubs and some kind of lay their stems out and then will take root. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of variety in ground covers. Um, you know, when you have a plant that's anywhere from 15 to 20 feet tall, it's kind of an overlapping of, of a shrub and a tree. And one example that we have in our area is Great Myrtle. Um, they, there, there are some very large shrubs that are sort of shrub forms. Um, also, Great Myrtle can be a multi-stem tree or a single stem tree. If you look at all the varieties, you can have a dwarf, a uh, very petite, uh, a, a foot or so to a three to four foot shrub, to a five to six foot shrub, to a large tree. And in the southern and southeastern states, um, the crepe myrtles get even bigger than they do here. So you're looking at a 20, 20 foot plus tree, sometimes a single stem. So there's a lot of variety there. And another sort of general method of classification is by its leaf retention. So we'll refer to plants many times evergreen or deciduous, you know, the two big groups, evergreen 
meaning that the plant retains its leaves year-round. Um, they do replace leaves, but they don't have a big drop like in the fall, like deciduous plants. So um, the evergreens have uh, sort of two main groups, uh, needle leaf and broadleaf. And the broadleafs really have more in common with, the, with most of the deciduous plants, but the broadleaf evergreens will keep their leaves all year long, just like the needle leaf plants do. Um, deciduous is what we're studying in this class. And it's mostly broadleaf. You have a couple of needle leaf evergreens, but mostly broadleaf. And they lose their leaves in the fall. And then the, um, the woody part of the plant remains alive but dormant. And then the plant leaves out uh, in the spring, each spring. Now there are some plants that are considered semi-evergreen because they, they mainly don't lose their leaves because of the fading light in the fall they'll lose their leaves just simply because of the climate conditions. So we can have some plants that may be deciduous in Oklahoma and in a very mild clim climate, um, maybe evergreen, because they're not affected by light levels. They're only losing their leaves because of um, the, the, the severity of, of the winter. Plants basically have two names that you can use. Um, their common name is is um, used more, um, it's used more, well, more commonly. Um, and it has very little to do with the scientific name, although it might, may be related. Um, it can be confusing because there are, there's kind of almost a lot of slang in common names. Um, you may have one common name that's used for more than one, more than one plant. Uh, the snowball bush, that, that sort of common name can be used for viburnums, spirea, uh, any kind of kind of white flowering, spring flowering plant. There are a lot that are called snowball bush. Or one plant may have more than one common name. So you may have a plant that's called the this one particular example, Moses in the boat or Moses in the cradle. Um, one of the trees that we'll look at in our labs has the common name of Osage orange, hedge apple, Bodark, horse apple. Um, so just four right there. So one person may know it as hedge apple, one person may know it as bodark, and they don't realize that they're talking about the same plant. Um, the, the European white water lily has an amazing amount of common names, so that could be very confusing if you're, if you're trying to, um, to use the common name. The botanical name is really what you're going to go by. Um, when you're working in the industry, when you're researching plants uh, for, for using them for some reason, uh, when you're trying to communicate with people about plants, um, it's, it's sometimes a little bit more relaxed to use the common name, but really if you want to be specific, you need to use the botanical name. Um, we will use the genus and species um, as, as the names, but kind of to step back a little bit, that's that's considered the binomial system because it's two words, two binomial name, um, and this was developed mainly by um, Carl von Linn, who is also known as Carolus Linnaeus. Um, before Linnaeus, the botanical name was like almost like writing a sentence or a paragraph. Um, it would be very descriptive, and each botanist would add to the botanical name as they observed different things to describe about the plant. So they may be very, very long and changing, plus there wasn't instant communication back then. So some people may be using the newer botanical name, some people may be using the older botanical name that hasn't had additional descriptive words added. So it was very um, cumbersome. Um, so Carl von Linn, um, it developed using just the main, the genus and species. There were other people working on this at the time, but he, he mainly um, is the one that's credited for this system. The, the scientific classification of plants is basically referred to as plant taxonomy. And it's also, there's taxonomy for all living things, for plants, animals, uh, fungi, alga, you know, all algae, all these things. So, um, on your image there, you have the kingdoms, which are at the bottom. It used to just be the plant and animal kingdom, but now there are five. 
but plants are in a kingdom. Then to become more specific, you have divisions, um, which are also re referred to sometimes as phylum, um, but you have the flowering plants in one division and you have the cone-bearing plants in another division. So there are some plants we're going to study that actually are in, 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 in separate divisions very far back in the kind of sorting order. But as we get more specific, as we kind of go from seven, five, four, um, we get to number two, the genus, which is the, the, more, the most general, probably, uh, grouping that we'll use, and then the species. These are very specific. Um, they're very, very closely related plants. So we'll use, um, and this is, this is the, the way that just plant and animal classification works in the binomial system. The two words you use most often are the genus and the species. Now there's a, uh, there's a convention for presenting the genus and species when you, when you write it. Um, the genus is always capitalized and it's either underlined or italicized, but not both. So if you're handwriting, you can't really italicize when you're handwriting. I guess you could, but it'd be kind of hard. Um, so when you're handwriting the name, you would underline. Um, if, you, if it's in type, it could be either one, um, but not both. So um, either underline or italicize. The species name is in lowercase and the same, underlined or italicized, but not both. Um, we also have varieties, cultivars, and hybrids, what we'll get into in the next couple of uh, slides. The genus and species is sufficient for a lot of plants, and there, especially with some of the native plants like Quercus stellata, which is our post oak, there aren't a lot of, or any that I know of, um, cultivated varieties. So you have Quercus stellata that, you know, you have it, um, but a variety sometimes happens naturally. Sort of a subdivision of a species that exists in nature. There's just a little bit different, consistent difference that is re reproducible in the population. And so um, the variety name is treated the same as the species name, but with B-A-R uh, before it. Our example on your slide, Gladysia trichanthus, which is honey locust, there's a thornless variety that the population will reproduce itself, thornless, and enormous is the name of that, so it's Gladysia trichanthus variety enormous. A cultivated variety or a cultivar is when um, commercial plant producers have taken a, uh, a plant, either a a naturally occurring variety or sort of a, a mutant sort of sport, um, something that happened unusually. And it's normally propagated asexually, which means um, by, by cuttings, so that, it, so that the commercially produced cultivar can be very, very regular. And in your example there, Gladysia triganthos, cultivated by variety moraine, Moraine is a thornless and male variety. Um, so you can put CV in front of the cultivar name. You can also put it in single quotes. You'll most likely see it in single quotes. You usually see it as a CV in um, educational or botanical texts. Um, in industry, you usually see it with a single quote. So that's, that's how we'll use it uh, for the most part in the classroom work. One reason to use that, that level of detail in naming your plants is that when there are a lot of different cultivated varieties, a wide variety of cultivated varieties, the, um, the genus and species name just doesn't get you to the, to the level of detail that you need. If, say if you're specifying plants for a landscape job, um, you're just speaking with people about plants, you're recommending plants, whatever you may have happen to be doing with these plants. Our example, going back to, to, to crate myrtle, your standard crepe myrtle, 10 to 15 foot multi-stem tree. You may have a semi-dwarf type um, cultivar, six foot to eight foot, a three to four foot dwarf, or a 10, 12 inch to 18 inch dwarf. These are very, very different plants. And so you have to specify them using the cultivar name. 
Um, other, other plants may have cultivars not just for size and form, but for um, different types of foliage, different types of flower, different forms. So it's important to recognize that th these difference when you identify the plants, when you specify the plants, um, when you're working with them to know the differences available. Because some plants have been, and we will see when we look um, through the plants in our textbooks, some plants may have hundreds of cultivars and um, with very, you know, very big differences in between them. So you have to deal with them on that level. Another example of, of a plant naming convention is how you show that a plant is a hybrid. Um, a hybrid is typically uh, the, the breeding of two species, and so there's you put an X in front of the new species name. So on, on your example there, um, the cross between Ber Berberus thunbergii and Berberus juliana creates a brand new species, but since the species is a cross between two other species, an X is put in front of the new species name. So this is your introduction to uh, plant classification and naming, and um, in the next few um, presentations we'll get into plant ID characteristics. So thanks a lot, and be sure to keep in touch on the online uh, classroom and bring any questions that you may have to lab as well. Thanks.